We are America's morning headquarters. We're also your science headquarters. So every morning we're keeping you on the edge of innovation and technology. And that's why Scientific American joins us every Wednesday. The magazine celebrating its 170th birthday. Editor in chief Mariette De Cristina joins us with three of the biggest science stories it's covered in its history. Uh, Mariette, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we're celebrating right now Scientific American. It's amazing how many years you've been around. You cover things that include weather and climate, and you're hitting the 10th anniversary of Hurricane Katrina. What science takeaways did we learn from that hurricane? Right, so Scientific American, one of the great things about being at a magazine that's been around for 170 years is we look at things when they happen, before they happened, and after they happened. And Hurricane Katrina, I'm, you know, I'm actually, I'm quite sad to say, is an example of this. In 2001, we had an article that forecast what the problems were for New Orleans as a city a little bit below the sea level with Lake Pontchartrain and the Gulf of Mexico right there. We talked about the engineering challenges of it. And then, unfortunately, far, four years later, there was Hurricane Katrina, which we are marking the 10th year of this year. So what Scientific American has on its website right now is actually a 10th anniversary in-depth report about Hurricane Katrina and the kind of catastrophic lessons that we learned there about, about engineering, about building levees, about building about actually taking a more system-wide approach when you really want to protect an area rather than try to do uh, little bits here and there. And that's one of the many lessons that this special report covers. Uh, and Marianne, as we talk about some of what Scientific American has covered and we look at some of the past covers, as editor-in-chief, what's it like to have access to the minds and the articles that really put this forward, this information forward, in a way that's really easy to digest for just your, your common person, not just your scientist? Right. Gosh, what a privilege it is. Can I tell you? Uh, I think I have... Um, I'm glad to be on the science headquarters. I think maybe the two of us have the best jobs that there are. Um, <laughs> So Scientific American has had actually more than 150 Nobel laureates write for it over the years. But way back on its anniversary, in, uh, which was August 28, 1845, we were in the middle of the, um, you know, our young nation's industrial revolution. So we had lots of inventors come by our office. And one of them who came by plenty was uh, Thomas Edison, you know, the wizard of Menlo Park, not so far from where I'm sitting here right now in New York. And Edison used to walk three miles a week to get, when he was a boy, to get his copy of Scientific American. And I have a little story for you about what he did when he, uh, when he got, grew, grew up as a, an inventor. Can I tell it to you? Yeah, we have about 20 seconds. Can we get it in? <laughs> okay, yeah, awesome. So he brought in the phonograph. So the first time, was first time ever displayed. And it said to the editors, hello, how do you do? How do you like the talking box? And we displayed how this was done. And then Scientific American went on to found a patent agency branch and bring lots of inventions to folks in the field. Thanks very much. Wow, Maria DeCristina, thank you so much.